this webinar, Nearshoring, a Strategic Tool for the Finance Function. I'd like to start by introducing our speakers for today. First off is Roel Vega. Roel is the CEO for Oxus and our resident expert on all things nearshoring. He has a very vast background in consulting and significant multinational experience that he will share with you in today's webinar. Next is Tony Patel. Tony recently joined the Oxus management team, but prior to that served as CFO for PepsiCo Beverages Latin America. While at Pepsi, he led the establishment of a nearshore shared services center, and he'll bring his unique perspective and hands-on experience um, in the process of today's webinar. Last but not least, we have Gina Solari. Gina has a background in marketing and PR and is the investment promotion executive for Sinday. Sinday is a non-for-profit organization whose purpose is to drive and attract foreign investment into Costa Rica. And Gina will offer her thoughts on Costa Rica and some insight on how it's emerged as a growing nearshore player. Just a reminder for all attendees, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in your webinar panel chat area, and we'll address all the questions at the conclusion of the webinar. And with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Raul Vega. Raul? Thanks, Renee. So we're going to cover this nearshore topic from a variety of angles. Uh, Initially, we want to review kind of some key trends and a macro overview of what really is driving nearshore and put it in context of some of the broader economic trends. Uh, and then we want to hear some real-world perspectives uh, from Tony Patel, who was a former CFO at Pepsi and led the establishment of their nearshore center um, over the last several years. And then we'll leave some time at the end for some Q&A. But as Renee mentioned, if you would like to ask some questions throughout, just submit it and we will uh, try to address them. Uh, so to begin, you know, we want to really look at the economy we perform under and, and, are, and are operating under. And, and it really, it's, it, we have a, a period of really intense competition and high business volatility. Uh, I think we've all seen that over the last several years. But this has really been going on really for the last 15 or 20 years as globalization has increased and, and technology has advanced to an incredible level. Uh, one of the good ways of looking at this is it's just looking at Fortune 500 turnover uh, since 1990. And if you go back and look at 1990, the companies that were in the Fortune 500, 75% of those companies are gone, no longer listed uh, for a variety of reasons. Either competition has, has knocked them out of business or they've been merged or acquired. Uh, and even looking back over the last 10 years, you have 40% of the companies that are in 2000 were no longer on the list. Uh, by 2010, and even going a smaller time frame, 2005 to 2010, you have almost a third, which is a pretty incredible numbers when you think about them of the largest global organizations and the churn that is happening. You can only imagine what that data is when you start looking at smaller middle market companies. And if you really look at some of the drivers are, it's really that traditional business models are really under duress and are being challenged for a variety of reasons, which I'll highlight a few here. I mean, one, it's just innovation. Companies are coming out of nowhere and really challenging entire industries. If you look at some of the big companies we think of today, Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook, Twitter, I mean, the oldest one of those companies is less than 20 years old, which is Amazon, which started in 95. Google started, I believe, in 97, 98. Uh, and Twitter is less than 10 years old. So you have these companies coming out of nowhere and really changing entire industries, which obviously that's part of what you're seeing in this Fortune 500 turnover. But it's even companies that are not technology driven. In the retail business is an a company called Zara that came out of a very remote area of Spain, northern Spain, to now become the largest uh, apparel retailer in the world. Uh, and they've used technology and supply chain uh, to really pass companies like Benetton and Gap, uh, which are more widely known. Another big change has been the power that, that customers have and consumers have and the choices they have. And a lot of that is technology driven, but that's really being put pressure in a lot of consumer driven companies uh, where the customer has a lot of information and it has a lot of choices. Uh, and if you look at a company like Best Buy, the great example of that, they've been under duress because of companies going in, customers going in and, and looking at their products and then going online with their mobile device. And, and pretty much buying the cheapest alternative. Uh, another big change that is really requiring companies to have a lot more flexibility. Uh, technologies like the cloud and mobile, which are driving a lot of the, the first two bullets, are really creating new business options. And are a key driver we're going to talk about today uh, with nearshoring and really offshoring as well. 
Um, that would not have been possible 15, 20 years ago without advances in technology. Not only the ones here we talked about in terms of cloud, but also ERP technologies, uh, the general internet and the access, telecommunications, broadband, uh, all these things that create new alternatives that really impact uh, what you can do in the back office. And finally, the emergence of different regions of the world to really become a player in a variety of industries. Specifically, what we're going to talk about today is the service industries, uh, which everybody's familiar with, India rising, the Philippines, but really that's really a big driver of Latin America. And what we're going to talk about today is that now these labor pools can be reached and provide services uh, to consumers that are halfway around the world, uh, which is completely changing the perspective that a lot of customers have and increasing competition. Now, one of the things you find, I'll find interesting is that CFOs particularly, and we're going to talk about finance a lot today, are really on the hot seat. Um, and this is some information from a study from Chris Holder and Associates, which has been going on for about 20 years now. And um, they basically are an executive search firm that tracks really CEO and CFO turnover. Uh, and if you look at their studies, CFO turnover is just slightly over five years, uh, which is 24% less than CEOs. So the CFOs really are going in for short periods of time, and then they're really being held accountable for any kind of performance shortages, much greater than CEOs or vice presidents of sales or COOs. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, CFO turnover has exceeded CEO turnover for every year that this survey has been done. So the reality is CFOs are at the, at the front end of this, and the finance organization is at the front end of that. And what we've seen in this study is over the last two years, that volatility has increased. Um, so that gives us a little bit of context into kind of more of the global picture. Um, now, what I want to talk about here a little bit now is what are organizations doing and, and, and how nearshoring and, and finance and accounting outsourcing and shared services can help. But before I get into that, what we're hoping to get out of it is, a, is you kind of see a new perspective. And I'm going to introduce you to a concept called Scotoma, um, which basically is it, it refers to something that is in front of you but you never see. But once you it's pointed out to you, you can't help but see it. That's really the definition of this. And I'll give you an example, which is the whole FedEx uh, logo. For most people, we've seen this for, for years and years, but most of us don't realize there's an arrow that was put into it that is kind of their logo. That once someone points it out to you, every time you look at this logo, you're going to wind up seeing your eye going to that arrow. And really, that's what we're seeing with nearshoring. Nearshoring is a concept that really is not widely known, widely available. And a lot of people don't believe that it really applies to them. And what we're hoping is after you see what the information is presented here today, you'll realize, gosh, this is a new way I can look at my back office and a way I can become more competitive and, and create more efficiencies and effectiveness in my operating model. So let's get into a little bit of, of nearshoring and why we consider it a transformational opportunity. Uh, from a finance and accounting perspective, uh, which is what we call FAO, this has been one of the fastest growing segments of the outsourcing industry. Um, and it's really over the last half decade or so. Uh, when most people think of outsourcing, they think of call centers, they think of IT, where it's been much more well established. But really, FAO is growing and growing very rapidly. Uh, so some key data, just to kind of put it in perspective. The, the FAO market is estimated to exceed $4 billion in annual contract value, which is what, how the, the industry is measured, and $32 billion in total spending. Now, we believe that number is, is dramatically underreported because it's kind of very hard to get a handle on um, really the, the outsourcing deals that are out there. A lot of companies don't like to disclose that they're doing uh, these types of deals. But even with what's been reported and what can be tracked, uh, it's a pretty significant number. Uh, if you look at the growth rate, and a lot of this information comes from studies from the Everest Group, which is a market research firm that tracks this industry very closely. And it's pretty much bench, been double-digit growth over the last half decade between 10 11 percent in, in the low years and 15 to 20 percent in the high years. And it's really increased in 2011, and last year was projected to be in the 15 to 20 percent range. So a lot more companies are looking at that. A lot more deals are getting done. Another key data point is a study done by Deloitte, which analyzed and, and surveyed uh, a broad range of CFOs and companies and asked them, if they are using outsourcing today. And 37% are already doing some form of outsourcing. Could be payroll, uh, you know, which a lot of firms do. Uh, but 53% of them are expected to increase outsourcing. So this is a growing trend, and it's one that 
a lot of CFOs and C controllers, if they're not considering, really need to, to take a look at. Um, today, most of the companies that have benefited from this have been multinational corporations. So they have the scale and the breadth and depth of talent to really take this on, whether it's a shared services captive model where they're running themselves or an outsourcing model. And what's happened is they're the ones that have driven cost advantages and operational advantages, which make, give them significant competitive advantages over middle market and smaller companies, which is one of the things we see changing now with the phenomena of nearshoring. So as we get into what are the types of models if you're looking to do FAO? The first one is an in-country model, which is where this all started, where basically the service is performed in the same country that the service is received. So that's your traditional, let's say, ADP or paychecks model where you outsource locally. could be within your own city or within your own country. Then we have the rise of offshoring, which is really where the service is performed in another country where the labor is significantly cheaper, but it's very far from a time zone and geographic perspective from where the service is received. And then finally, nearshoring is really similar to offshoring in terms of the services performed in a country separate from where the, the service is received, but the time zone is significantly closer. It could be the same time zone uh, or could be adjacent. And that's really the big change over the last several years, and that's what we're going to really get into now. So let's talk a little bit about nearshoring and, and Latin America and what's really happening there uh, and the emergence of Latin America, which has really been over the last decade or so. Uh, if you were to go back to the 90s, uh, this was a non-existent market in, in, in Latin America in terms of servicing the U.S. Uh, so let's put a little context to it. Uh, if you really look at the top 100 global outsourcing destinations, and this is from an organization called Bolands who analyzes every year what the outsourcing, top outsourcing destinations are, 23% of them are Latin American cities, uh, which is a huge number and it's a huge growth from if you go back several years into uh, what were the top outsourcing destinations, which are primarily Asian-based uh, locations. Now the top five in, in this study are Costa Rica, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay. Now, very interesting, Costa Rica, and we're going to get into more about Costa Rica, because they've been the kind of a leading adopter um, of this model. Brazil has come up recently, but really Brazil, when you really look at as an outsourcing destination, it is really more geared towards the Brazilian market. Uh, it is not really an exporter of services um, to other countries, primarily because of the cost. The Brazil labor market is very expensive uh, compared to most of, of Latin America, or all Latin America, and even to the U.S. Um, in our experiences working with some of our Brazilian clients, um, you're looking at about 30% cost differential between Sao Paulo, Brazil, and the United States. And in the United States, we're talking about more even the higher labor markets within the United States, urban markets. Now, there are sections of Brazil uh, up in the Northeast that are lower cost centers, so there's a lot of you know, outsourcing happening within Brazil, but again, it's really not a competitive from a near short perspective if you're looking for a U.S. model or you're looking to do a regional Latin American model. Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay are similar to Costa Rica in that manner, uh, and they are players that are, are coming up. Yeah. Another data point is AT Kearney's Global Services Study, uh, where they, they do periodically, and they have 13 of the top 50 countries being Latin America which is a similar percentage uh, to Poland. So that's two different respectable research firms that have put out data that kind of validates what's happening from a Latin America perspective. Uh, AT Kearney's top five are, are Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, and Argentina. So really the only change between the two is you have the addition of, of Mexico uh, over Uruguay. Uh, but very similar analysis. Now when we look at nearshoring, we really don't consider all of Latin America to be a near short play uh, for the United States market. Uh, and the reason of that is geographic proximity. Uh, one of the big advantages of near shore is, is time zone, which all of Latin America has. Uh, you're either in a, a central or eastern time zone, so it's very convenient for, for the U.S. market. But also the ability to get there from a geographic perspective, the time travel, the travel time. And when you're really looking at the southern cone, which is the Chile, Uruguay, Argentina, and Brazil, 
you're really talking about long distances of flight, uh, which is a big disadvantage when you compare it to northern Latin America. So our definition of nearshore is really the Caribbean basin, which would include the circle there, which goes from Mexico through Colombia and then some of the Caribbean countries. And you have Costa Rica really right smack dab in the middle of it, uh, of that circle. And that's really our definition of, of a nearshore. So if you take that, really, the, the top destinations are Costa Rica, Mexico, and, and the top rated areas in Mexico are, are Mexico City, Monterey, and Guadalajara, uh, which shows there's three different cities in Mexico with its size that are really viable nearshore destinations and have developed the market. Uh, in Costa Rica, it's basically San Jose, and in Colombia, you have Bogota and also Medellin has also come up uh, as top nearshore destinations. So those are really the top markets if you look at the Bolin study and then use our definition of nearshore. And I will point out Guatemala and Nicaragua, which are also in Central America, are two emerging locations that just were added to the list in 2013. Now they provide some significant labor arbitrage benefits, but they do have some challenges in terms of English speaking skills and some of the business infrastructure and tend to be a little less mature in their offerings than the top five destinations that were previously mentioned. So with that as kind of some background on, on the big picture of Latin America, let's really look at Costa Rica, which has been rated the number one destination, and let's, let's figure out you know, what's happening there. I'm going to give a little background on that, and then we're going to bring in Gina to, to bring in some deeper perspective. Um, so the biggest thing that's, drive, that's driven Costa Rica has been its strategic location uh, in comparison to the United States. And, and what you see primarily is obviously a central time zone is a huge significant advantage. Uh, if you're trying to work, whether it's a shared services or BPO player, one of the big challenges that organizations have had when they've done this in Asia is time zone differences. Uh, you either have to come into work very, very early or stay in very late to try and manage an outsourced shared services operation, which provides a lot of strain on your employees and it's just not conducive to a lot of back office operations. Costa Rica has a central time zone, very convenient. It also has high accessibility uh, to most major cities in the U.S. You know, Costa Rica, as we know, is a big tourist destination, so they have a pretty developed uh, air traffic patterns with the U.S. And that's a big advantage is from a services perspective, because you could basically fly to most major cities in the U.S. from Costa Rica in two and a half to three hours with a direct flight. So that's a huge advantage, again, when you compare if you're trying to go to India, you're looking at a 15-plus hour trip. It's very hard to get your teams back and forth to work together. That's a huge advantage to having a successful uh, nearshore model. Um, another big point that I think is a significant advantage for Costa Rica is its political stability. They have not had an army for over 60 years, uh, and they've used that to invest in education. And it really provides a lot of stability. It's considered by many to be the Switzerland of Latin America. So it creates a lot of stability for you in, in putting a, a service center in place. And then it also has very strong telecom and infrastructure. They've done a lot to, to kind of develop the telecom infrastructure, telecom market um, and free it up and open it up to competition. And that's really paid benefits not only in cost, but also in redundancy and, and the ability to, to have strong communications, which is critical to this type of operation. In addition, you have the cost advantages in Costa Rica. Um, the labor arbitrage with the U.S., and this has been done through our experiences with multiple clients and studies we've done and, and, and then other third-party studies. And, and you're looking at a 25 to 50 percent labor differential uh, for comparable positions and skill sets between Costa Rica and the U.S. So it's a pretty significant number. It's not quite what you could achieve in an Asia-based model, but it's still a pretty big number for most U.S. operations. In addition, you have a lot less cost in travel, and your overall business infrastructure tends to be lower in terms of just the cost of doing business. So that's another huge benefit. And then finally, the, the workforce. Costa Rica has a very strong workforce. Uh, one of the biggest advantages they have is the cultural affinity with the U.S. They're very tied into a lot of U.S. culture. Uh, they follow our sports teams, listen to our music. Uh, and that really plays a big benefit when you're looking to implement uh, an offshore slash nearshore model because it really creates stickiness between the customer and, and the employee base. They also have a big advantage in, in English speaking skills. Uh, 
Costa Rica, and I'm sure Gene will get into it, has the strongest English language skills of any Latin American country. They have the highest ranked educational system. And finally, one of the big advantages, they've been a leader in attracting U.S. multinationals to set up back office shared services which has really created a very well-trained workforce that is used to working with some of the larger companies in the world and the, the standards that U.S. companies have. So really when you combine all these factors, that is really, is, is our belief, one of the, the big drivers of why Costa Rica has, has been uh, and is considered the leading destination um, for outsourcing. So with that, I'd like to bring in Gina to kind of provide a little bit more color commentary on, on Costa Rica and some of the drivers and dynamics of it. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Raul. Um, that was really a great introduction on Costa Rica, and it certainly speaks just volumes of our country's current value proposition and, of course, our competitiveness um, in the services sector. So I want to, of course, begin by thanking Oxus for this invitation. I appreciate everyone's time participating in today's webinar. As a private and nonprofit organization aimed at attracting direct foreign investment to our country, of course, these opportunities are always of great importance to, to CME. So as you can see by this first slide, um, while Costa Rica's economy is heavily influenced by the inflows of foreign direct investment, and we have seen significant growth in these figures, particularly since 2002, they've been increasing at about an average rate of 13% per year. So what differentiates Costa Rica from other Latin American countries in this aspect? Well, we currently attract foreign direct investment by concentrating on our efforts on efficiency and market access and most other Latin American countries attract FDI related to natural resources and local markets. So that has made our country a very attractive and open economy for diverse sectors such as life sciences, advanced manufacturing, clean technologies, and of course multiple other subsectors within business services. So some of the most relevant facts about our country, and you can see them also highlighted to your right in this slide, are that, well, we're a population of 4.7 billion, a labor force of 2.8 billion. Um, we export um, services, and today what that represents is um, close to $5.6 billion of our total of exports. So this has really signified that our economy in the last decade alone has shifted from agriculture to an industry and service-based economy. So as a born and raised Costa Rican, it has been extremely exciting to see this shift in our economy and, of course, to see um, you know, the reach um, that the services sector has um, been able to, to establish itself in Costa Rica. Now, we also boast of a literacy rate of 96%, the highest in the region, and it continues to prove that our education system, along with our public health care, are the pillars of our governmental and economic stability. So our government today allocates about 8% of our country's GDP towards health and 10% into education. Um, in Costa Rica, we have operating over 250 multinationals. Um, close to them, 50% um, are companies that are in the business services sector. So this is going to include operations related to everything from back office, shared service, finance and accounting, contact center, um, IT support and engineering, software development, digital production, logistics, um, R&D, and some other forms of sophisticated processes in both captive um, and outsourcing operations. So as we move to the next slide, we just want to showcase um, a few of, of those, those recent examples of companies that are invested in Costa Rica, um, and which in many cases are utilizing experienced service providers such as Oxus. Um, and they're really finding exceptional value in the quality and in the availability of our talent in their expertise that they have. Of course, language proficiency is key. Um, time zone ease, and there's just a lot of very important culture affinity factors that our country offers. So these companies um, such as IBM and Walmart um, and Thompson Routers, you know, they have also been able to experience our government's commitment to this sector um, and as they continue to promote the growth of the labor pool that's needed to support both short and long term these important projects. So as you can see, IBM, um, they established a recently global services center for IT outsourcing. Um, it's expected to grow by 1,000 employees by 2013. They evaluated other countries, um, and IBM decided to 
you know, make the center in Costa Rica their regional and global center, and they will be investing um, heavily, close to $300 million. Um, PNG also very recently this year announced a supply chain and planning um, regional center for Latin America. Um, it's going to employ over 1,200 um, by 2013 as well. Walmart, very similar. They announced a shared services center operation for all of their Latin business. Um, you know, and, and they, Costa Rica in this case, competed against other regions like Mexico or countries like Mexico and Argentina. Um, Ox is also a very strong player in our country within the services sector, um, offering BPO um, and accounting and IT services. Um, also, you know, when they came to Costa Rica, they evaluated other countries um, and decided that Costa Rica was the right choice for them. And recently as well, Thompson Routers, and they're doing a regional shared service center, which is a global center, um, and we were up against Argentina and Mexico. So really to summarize, um, I hope that you found this information that was useful and that can help as you're evaluating our country for any future BPO and ITO projects that you have. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Gina. I really appreciate that. I mean, one thing I will add is when we were looking to make our decision, just a little background on Oxus, I mean, we, we are a management consulting firm, and we help a lot of companies on a consulting basis set up shared services and do site location work. But we also have a division that actually does the outsourcing and provides those services. So we kind of wear both hats, and so our perspective is, is a little bit unique because we're an operator as well as an advisor to a lot of, a lot of large global companies. So when we were looking to make our decision, we were aware already and we're pretty well informed about the advantages of Costa Rica. And, and it has worked out very well for us uh, in terms of attracting top labor, pool, labor market and, and people who really were used to working at a very high level with the standards that you know, the P&Gs or the Walmarts of the world have and, and the PepsiCo's that we'll talk about, uh, which you're not necessarily going to get in other countries. And really the, another big advantage has been the English speaking skills. And, and that has been really, it sticks out very well. And it's very, very important if you're looking to provide services to, or to any kind of U.S. business, whether it's your own business or as a third party. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. So let's just to summarize. What are some of the pros and cons of, of this Latin American nearshore model or an Asia-based model? If you're really sitting there and you're looking at, you know, what's the best thing that will work for you, uh, here's, here's our perspective on it. From a pro's perspective, it, it's very hard to, to overcome, in, in, in my opinion, uh, the geographic proximity and time zone benefits that you get in the near shore when you're trying to, if you move to an offshore model. These are significant advantages for the overall success of this type of initiative. It creates tremendous challenges uh, if you're not nearby. And some examples you know, I'll give you is you know, so a lot of our clients, when we're doing a transition, they literally can fly down to Costa Rica, they can work with the teams, they can meet the teams, and, and that really creates a bond that is very strong as you're looking to make this change. Whether it's shared services or outsourcing, it's still a dramatic transformational change in your organization. And geographic proximity and time zone are huge. Uh, cultural affinity is right there with it. Uh, it, it, it. It makes a huge world of difference when the service provider, uh, the person doing the AP or the IT work, really can share a lot of, of discussions with the, their counterparts in the U.S., uh, whether it's talking about the latest basketball game or music or things like that, really create a stickiness that is very important to the success of these initiatives. Language skills are huge. Uh, one of the things we've seen with a lot of our clients is, is uh, and this is really on the advisory side as well, is, is that really sometimes they have a hard time understanding the Asian-based English accent. A Latin American accent tends to be something we're more used to in the U.S., uh, it's more common, and it creates less of an issue. Uh, and and that's, that's a key success factor as well. Turnover traditionally has been much lower in Latin America than in the Asia-based markets. Uh, now, some turnover is increasing in Latin America, but it's still significantly lower. Uh, and that's a huge issue and a huge advantage for you if you're looking to implement you don't want to be training people and having a lot of turnover. It can cause a lot of disruption to your operation. Uh, so turnover is a big advantage. And then the business infrastructure. Uh, the business infrastructure is very strong in Latin America and has significant advantages over a lot of the Asian-based countries that you may be evaluating. So those are significant pros. 
the cons primarily come down to cost. Uh, while you have significant cost advantages in uh, Latin America, as I explained, um, they're still 10 to 30 percent higher than what you could eventually achieve in an Asia-based model, specifically India and the Philippines, which tend to be the, the two leading markets. So if you're really looking for just strictly low cost and direct labor cost, uh, then you got Asia has advantages. I would advise to look at the total cost of providing the services, including travel cost and, 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 and turnover cost. And if you include some of those, the gap would narrow. But straight labor cost uh, is definitely an advantage for Asia. Um, the other disadvantage um, that Latin American countries tend to have is they tend to be smaller countries, with the exception of Mexico. So the labor pool in general tends to be smaller. Uh, now, I do think if you look deeper into the numbers and you start looking at the actual qualifications, you know, some of that gets narrowed. Uh, and I don't think there's any real issue unless you're going really huge that you're not going to be able to find a qualified labor pool. Uh, but that is tends to be an advantage. Obviously, India is a billion dollar, a billion person population. Uh, they have a lot of people to eventually train and, and work. But obviously, they're not all qualified workers. Uh, so that's kind of the way we view the pros and cons. So nearshoring really provides the big advantages is it provides a more viable alternative for a broader range of organizations. If you're a huge organization that has real depth of management and a lot of talent, uh, you could probably pull off an Asia-based model and get it working. It's been proven. A lot of them have had challenges and have moved back, but it, it works. But if you're a middle market organization that tends to have leaner management structures, you re this was never really something that you would consider viable. Now with nearshoring, this is really something you can handle and take care of. So it has opened up the door for, for organizations. So let's talk a little bit about the cost savings, okay? And, and what you're going to be able to achieve typically in, in a nearshore opportunity. Bottom line is you're going to start off with labor arbitrage. And that's the labor differential on an employee by employee basis uh, between the US and, and the nearshore model. You're going to get 25 to 50% in savings there. Now another big layer that comes on top of that on this all cases is operational efficiency. By hiring people who are focused and experts, in business processes and also tend to bring technology, you'll get another 15 to 30 percent typically in efficiency. Uh, and that's been our experience with a broad range of clients. It's almost guaranteed that you're going to start driving efficiencies in there. And that layers on top of, of your labor arbitrage. And then finally, there is cross-company leverage. Now this applies more to an outsource scenario in a shared services captive scenario. And this really applies to specialized skill sets that can now be better leveraged, or management skill sets that are maybe under leveraged uh, in one company, but as you can broaden it to support multiple customers, multiple entities, that tends to lower your cost for highly specialized or managerial skills that's above and beyond the labor arbitrage and the operating efficiencies. So there's pretty compelling financial reasons uh, that you should be considering incorporating a nearshore model in, in your back office. Now, our belief is that's just part of the story. The biggest benefit comes of really getting a better business model, getting your finance organization to focus on high value activities, strategic planning, business analysis, areas of the business that are really going to make a difference to the organization versus transaction processing. And the benefit to that you know, is huge. Now, it's harder to quantify, but if you can spend more time helping drive the business, you can bring a lot more value to the organization. So a well-done model for, for, for shared services or outsourced accounting back office is really going to drive that and enable that. You're also going to get a lot more flexibility and access to part-time skills that are very specialized in a more cost-effective manner. So you have the ability to flex up and down as business flexes up and down. So when we look at tying it into our original discussion on the volatility uh, of the economy and how you know businesses are coming and going and technology is changing. Uh, competitive advantages, you need to have a more flexible structure. If you have a completely employee-based organization in one location, you have a lot less flexibility than when you move to a more nearshore shared services slash outsourcing model. Uh, and finally, the one that I, I think is huge, and it is not obvious to a lot of people, is by moving to a shared services model, you tend to wind up with a much more motivated workforce. And, and the reason for that, in our experience, has been most accounting departments or IT departments are considered a cost center. 
they're under a lot of pressure to, to spend less, and it's not necessarily the greatest long-term environment, especially for people that are doing transaction processing. You kind of shift that whole thinking when you move it to a shared services environment, because now you're moving them from the back of the house to the front of the house, and they now have customers, um, they have service levels to meet, you can create more, you can be more creative in your incentive plans, and you, you create uh, just a more motivating and, and rewarding environment. That's even better when you do it in an outsourced environment because you also have the ability to create better career pathing and get people to work on different industries, different clients, and, and you can attract higher quality folks. And that's a huge advantage that should be considered when you're looking at incorporating this type of model. So at the end of the day, when you combine all this and you combine the significant cost savings is really what we think is transformational and creates breakthrough performance opportunities uh, for your organization. Uh, so with that, I want to really dive into now, you know, that was good background on it, but let's get into real world examples. We'll spend the rest of this on real world examples. Um, first, we're going to talk right now about two companies that have, have recently implemented Nearshore, TigerDirect.com and PepsiCo. I'm going to talk at first about Tiger Direct. Their CFO is going to join us, but unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, and, but I'm going to give a little background on that, and we'll dive deeper into Pepsi and their story and their advantages, and I'll hand it over to Tony. But just for a little background on Tiger Direct, they're a $3.5 billion publicly traded retailer of computer equipment, very similar to, say, Best Buy, but from an online model. They have some stores, about 40 stores, but it's more online. They, they also have the brand CircuitCity.com and, and CompUSA. Their challenge was, as we talked about earlier with the showrooming concept, they're under a lot of Industry, a lot of competitive pressure in terms of pricing and margins, very tight. They need to get efficient. Uh, and they really needed to do something different in their back office. They have a very large transaction volume scenario and, and they um, very tight margins. So they incorporated nearshoring over the last 18 months and migrated to offices as Costa Rica Center. Different functions like AP, collections, cash application, bank reconciliation, and even credit card fraud management and have been able to achieve back office labor arbitrage savings of 40% by implementing that model. And that was a transition that happened over a three or four month period and, and really has been worked out very well for them. And, and they had originally, what's interesting is they had originally outsourced some activities to India and had brought it back within three or four months because it just didn't go well for them. And it was a good example of how Nearshore has been able to come in and by having it in a Nearshore model, it has worked out very, very well for them and has, has increased dramatic reductions in cost and it really increased the ability of the finance team to, to focus on higher value activities. Uh, now we want to spend a little bit more time on Pepsi and just a little background on Pepsi. This is the Latin American beverage division that we're talking about that operates across Latin America and the Caribbean. They had gone through some explosive growth uh, over earlier in the decade and really had, had needed to kind of standardize and get more efficient. And they evaluated both Costa Rica and Mexico and went with a Mexico shared services. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tony and let him kind of talk about their journey and where they're at. Hey, thanks, Roel, and good afternoon to uh, everyone joining us. Um, as uh, Roel mentioned, uh, at, uh, I'm the, used to be the CFO for, uh, for the Latin American division for the last, uh, for the last six years. Uh, and you know, decided you know very early on that you know due to the you know complexity of, of my finance organization, the fact that you know we're we have businesses in over you know over 45 countries with a uh, plethora of, of really of bottlers, uh, distributors, co-packers, uh, bottling plants. Uh, more importantly, uh, a lot of legal entities over over 60 legal entities and over 375 reporting entities. So most of my time as the CFO uh, for at least the, you know, the first couple of years really were, were spent mostly on you know, the finance, the accounting, uh, the back office, and, and really not, not focusing on, on what I think a, a finance should, uh, organization should be focusing on, regardless of whether they're a $70 billion company or a $100 million company. Uh, should really be focused on more of the high value type activities, uh, the strategy, the business development, really the being the right hand uh, person for uh, for their general manager. Uh, so, in, in light of all of these, uh, you know, uh, different challenges, which uh, you know I'll go uh, over them 
with you now on the next slide. Uh, one, we had you know very limited operating uh, scalability. Uh, there was really a lack of, of process standardization, and especially for a consumer goods company, and, and as I mentioned, with a lot of uh, different entities and bottling plants and different locations and so on and so forth, uh, really lack that you know that that standardization process that I think you know as, as a finance professional as well as just a, a business professional overall, you really should be looking at. Uh, the other challenge we faced were were really a duplicity of a lot of activities across all of Latin America. Just to give you a little bit of, of, of background, we have or we had an, an HQ uh, here in, in, in the U.S., but then we also had offices in Mexico. We had accounting offices in Guatemala, uh, and uh, as well as uh, Argentina and Brazil. So, as you can imagine, you know, very difficult to uh, to get information, uh, the flow of information, and really, uh, you know. We became more reactive from from a from a business perspective rather than being proactive, because the numbers were pretty much interspersed throughout throughout Latin uh, throughout Latin America, and then uh, you know more importantly too, uh, you know in terms of systems, you know various systems, uh, various structures across across Latin America. So so very quickly, uh, you know I thought we we need a, a better solution, and that's when uh, I guess you know two and a half three years ago. Um, you know, we called uh, we called Oxus, uh, you know, Roll and his team, and, and sat down and, and really, you know, started brainstorming as to you know how do we lay this out, and, and very quickly we came up to a shared service solution. Um, then the next question was, you know, where do we basically stand this up? Is it you know Costa Rica, as uh, you know, as Roll and, and and Gina had just alluded to, you know, a great country. Uh, is it Mexico? Is it Brazil? Is it Guatemala? These other countries that I just mentioned that we had businesses in, and uh, at the end of the day, we we did our viability study, and uh, we ended up with with two finalists: one being Costa Rica, the other one being Mexico. And, and really, the reason that you know, as PepsiCo, we selected uh, Mexico because you know, obviously, we have uh, uh, most of our 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 beverage business is quite quite large in Mexico, and unfortunately in Costa Rica, it, it's uh, it's not as large as Mexico. So that's you know one of the reasons, and I would say probably the only reason we we selected uh, Mexico as uh, as one of our you know at, to stand up our shared service center for the Latin American division of uh, of PepsiCo. So as as we did this, and and it was a fairly seamless uh, you know fa fairly seamless process. Uh, what, are, what were some of the, uh, you know, the benefits that we were able to uh, to extract from from standing up this shared service center in in Mexico? Number one, we really established a, a what I like to call a finance and accounting operations center of excellence, uh, which is you know a term that's that's thrown around a lot, but at PepsiCo, it really is something that is very highly regarded specifically you know after after we uh, basically stood up and migrated this shared service center with all of the Latin American back offices so for example you know the H, uh, HQ Guatemala the Argentinas and the Brazils which I mentioned we had uh, back office activity in accounting and finance now all of a sudden in Mexico you know the US started looking at it uh, my global colleagues other CFOs in Asia Pacific and uh, in Europe also started looking at it uh, and effectively, uh, in the last, you know, uh, I would say 18 to 24 months, uh, a lot of the other uh, offices, finance uh, divisions across PepsiCo are also migrating to a shared service uh, solution. The other, I think, key item that uh, we benefited from was really a, an overall strengthening of, of, of overall controls. Uh, you know, for example, I think a lot a lot of the folks on the phone are familiar with with SOX and all of the controls and testing that uh, come along with that. Uh, we were able to reduce really uh, our the, the the controls that that we tested by by over fifty percent, which, which is huge, which is huge, right? And and Roel had mentioned as part of his presentation, uh, you know, that second tranche on operating efficiency, uh, the percentage of benefit that we can extract from that, and that's where. Uh, this would come in, right? We're, we're becoming a lot more efficient. If we became a lot more efficient 
testing a lot uh, less uh, less controls. The the other key point or key benefit, uh, we became very cost effective. So uh, you'll see I'll share some of the uh, the hard numbers uh, from you, but we were able to get some labor arbitrage specifically from moving from the U.S. operation over to to Mexico. Not so much in the other countries like Guatemala and Argentina, but Brazil, which, uh, as most of you know, is a very high uh, cost of living. We were also able to extract some some labor benefits there as well. So I would say overall it was the right, not only strategic decision, but it was the right business decision. And um, you know, as I look back, you know, two and a half years ago when I made this decision, and the last year or so that we basically had that shared service. Uh, center fully operational in Mexico, uh, you know, it was the right, definitely the right, you know, decision from a finance, from an accounting, and an overall strengthening of, of controls. Now, if, if, if we move to the next slide, and you look at what kind of services, you know, the shared services, you know, I thought, you know, three years ago, four years ago, when I, I too didn't know much about shared services, that it was really all about back offices, right, accounts payable, uh, travel entertainment, intercompany accounting, uh, you know, purchase to pay, things of that nature. But with PepsiCo, it's probably similar to uh, the companies that uh, that you're in. Uh, you know, there are other functions. And what we did at PepsiCo is we actually migrated uh, our logistics. So, for example, uh, at PepsiCo, we export uh, from the U.S. Uh, to the Caribbean and, and, and vice versa for the Caribbean uh, also to other uh, areas, not only in Latin America, but also to other areas in, around the globe. And we, will, we were able to basically migrate that over to Mexico, making that whole operation uh, a lot more uh, efficient, uh, both from a controls perspective and also from a cost perspective. We're able to uh, take all of the, the A&M. A&M stands for advertising and marketing, as you can imagine, in any consumer goods company a large number in, in the P&L. We were able to transfer or migrate that uh, over to Mexico extremely successfully. And uh, you know, a year and a half ago, uh, or before we had the shared services in Mexico, it was really a nightmare to you know ask a simple question. For example, you know, how much did we spend behind brand Pepsi marketing in the first quarter of you know 2012? I would have to call, you know, all of the other, you know, four uh, CFOs in all the different countries that I alluded to, and you know, maybe a week, in a week, or a week and a half uh, from my initial request, I would get the number. Now, uh, you know, it's very simple. You call one person who basically is a dedicated resource in the shared service center, who manages advertising and marketing, and that number is is readily available. The same with, you know, pricing calculations, uh, support to the bottlers or to the customers, right, uh, that most companies have. So, you know, shared services, once again, three years ago, two and a half years ago, I thought it was all about, you know, really the accounts payable and accounts receivable and inventory, but it really is a lot more than that once you, you have the basics in place, which uh, that's exactly what we did at, at the PepsiCo Latin American division. So, finally, just to share with you, I mentioned uh, sharing a little bit of, of, of the benefits. Um, our average savings were, were roughly about $30,000 per person. Uh, and then uh, you know, we talked about the 5 or 10% operational efficiency. And as Raul mentioned it uh, in his presentation, uh, it's something that you know, we were able to, to quantify uh, once we shifted over a lot of the other services, uh, as I mentioned, logistics and the export business for the Latin American division. Uh, we were able to also, you know, standardize and, and really rationalize a lot of the processes. Uh, they're now, PepsiCo is now in the process of migrating all of their uh, enterprise resource planning system over to SAP. That's obviously simplified a lot, of, uh, a lot of those issues. And as I mentioned, regarding scalability and consolidation of activities, where before uh, I would have to pick up the phone four or five times. Now, you know, the, the, the current CFO picks up one, you know, the phone, calls one person at the shared service center, and, and basically, uh, you know, requests the information that is needed, and it's readily available. What has that done? Obviously, that strengthened overall controls, but more importantly, it has allowed the business folks, specifically in finance, in accounting, and general management, to be a lot more uh, proactive rather than being reactive, as I mentioned before, when we had all of this complexity uh, and really madness, if you will, 
across the uh, Latin American division of, of PepsiCo. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to, to Roll and see if uh, there are any questions from, uh, from the group. Yeah, Tony, thanks. Uh, I actually did get a question, and in, in, in that was about the implementation approach that someone typed up and what your biggest challenges were with that in terms of implementing it, the shared service center. Yeah, I think there was a, a few challenges there. Were. Number one, really the, the, the reticence of, of, of senior management, uh, including myself, as, and I put myself as, as senior management, in, in uh, you know, losing, you know, you, you, hear, you heard a lot, specifically myself, in terms of, hey, I'm going to lose control of my accounts payable, I'm going to lose control of, of my, my inventory, and I tell you, as, as, as I spoke more to you and, and the OXIS team, which were, which were great all along the way in, in educating us about, you know, shared services, uh, uh, you know, I in turn became more comfortable. And in fact, as I look back now, uh, you know, I had in, in those times, I had a lot more control than I actually had before. Uh, you know, that's number one. Uh, number two, in terms of, of, of the implementation, I would say uh, one thing that worked well uh, is is taking it in, in in small baby steps. In other words, you know, take it because it's it's a huge undertaking. Don't let anyone you know tell you otherwise. It's it's extremely complicated. There's a lot going on. Uh, so take it in phases. You know, kind of take the project in, in little in little chunks along the way, uh, and that definitely works. And then the other the, the third piece I would say in terms of you know one of the implementation challenges is. The you know communicate right because as part of any shared services or as part of any consolidation from a lot of areas or a lot of divisions or a lot of countries or a lot of states into you know a shared service center obviously there's going to be some uh, some forced attrition if you will so make sure that you control you 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 communicate adequately what we did there at, at PepsiCo is we set up a, a steering committee very early on with all of the heads of HR, IT, uh, internal control, so on and so forth, as well as the front line or the business general management to ensure that at every point in time we were communicating exactly what was being done. Um, and then always have, you know, always have plan B and, and plan C because, you know, as, as, as I always say, uh, stuff will happen, but if you plan accordingly and you have a Plan B and a Plan C, just in case Plan A does not uh, get implemented properly, that you know the business does not get uh, disrupted. I would like to say too, Roll, that you know along the way when we did all of the migration from, as I mentioned, you know Brazil headquarters uh, and, and the other countries, uh, we closed right on time. Uh, there weren't really any control issues, uh, and there we really didn't really miss a step uh, along the way. And that is, uh, you know, I think one of the big reasons behind that is the fact that, you know, everyone was well educated as to what was going to happen, when it was going to happen, uh, and we had open lines of communication throughout the uh, through, throughout the organization. And as I alluded to, uh, you know, PepsiCo is now has looked at the Mexico Latin American Beverages uh, Shared Service Center as as really a center of excellence and something that they see as a best practice, and that it's now being uh, rolled out across the globe at PepsiCo. That's great. Uh, there's another question here that I guess is in general, but I'll, I'll throw it to you because I'll answer it as well, but there was someone here asking about how do, you, how do we decide between doing a captive, internally run shared service center and a outsourced model? So maybe you can talk a little bit about your guys thinking there and then I'll talk about it for us. Yeah, the, the the thing with the, you know, out, outsource versus captive, uh, you know, we, we actually, you know, looked at both, but you know, maybe uh, unlike other other uh, companies that are not as, as global as PepsiCo. I mean, PepsiCo we has businesses in all you know 150 plus countries around the world, uh, and as I mentioned, we had fairly sizable sizable businesses in Mexico as uh, well as Brazil. Number one, uh, number two, when you look at those two countries, Brazil and Mexico. Uh, you know, similar to Costa Rica, you've got, you know, qualified individuals, you've got a, a fairly uh, a good labor pool, if you will. Uh, so, you know, from that perspective, those two were always in the, uh, in, in the running. And, and as I mentioned, we did look at, at Costa Rica, uh, and we would have, you know, gone to, uh, to Costa Rica. However, we decided not to, 
know, for the reasons I mentioned, which is you, we, did, we don't really have a, a big uh, business, if you will, uh, in, in Costa Rica. So, and then Brazil ended up being really too, too expensive for us. So we decided on Mexico for A, it's, 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 it's one of the you know, biggest countries from a business perspective for, for Mexico. B, uh, a very good labor pool. Not only a labor pool outside of PepsiCo, but within PepsiCo, because what I'd like to mention, and that was one of the, the kind of the driving reasons why we uh, selected Mexico, is um, um, not only uh, you know do we have beverages, but we also have the Frito Lay division, which is a fairly large division in Mexico, with also a, a good labor force. So we were able to select really the the best of the best from some from each of these divisions to populate, if you will. Uh, you know our shared service center. I think you know we had the labor pool. We had you know we had the country. Uh, you know we had the you know the systems, if you will. So for us, it was it was a lot easier to have kind of a captive shared services and actually you know outsource everything uh, you know to uh, to a third party. And thus far, it's it's worked well. No, I agree with what you said there. I mean, I'll add a little bit to that. And then we have another question. That we got a couple more questions that came in. But um, I would also say a lot of organizations like, and I think Procter & Gamble, which is in Costa Rica, is a good example, started off captive shared services, got it to a certain point, and realized to really take it to the next level, they've outsourced pieces of it. And there's a, a hybrid model that where you have captive shared services with a component that's outsourced. And it's, it's kind of done both. And we're seeing a lot of that now. Uh, and then also, if, obviously, if, if you're not a Pepsi or a global organization, you almost move directly to an outsource model because of, of the capabilities. Um, but Tony, there was a question here to clarify on the Pepsi. Was you know was, the question is was was this a global shared service center? Um, which I can answer, it was not. It was it was focused on on Latin America and the beverages unit. Right. Uh, How, however, as as I mentioned, it, it it started off as Latin America, but and and you know maybe sorry for the confusion. What uh, what has happened was has has been based on the you know the success right and and the fact that it was almost done you know fairly seamlessly uh, you know there was obviously uh, pro, you know P and L benefits there was efficiency benefits there were you know standardization benefits like I mentioned you know the U S um, actually uh, you know started looking at it and they're they're they they too are you know migrating to you know, a shared service center as well as globally as well as the Asia Pacific unit. Uh, uh, with their CFO and as well as the Euro European unit with, with their CFO because at the end of the day I mean they've seen you know Latin American and it makes a lot of sense um, I, I may also add and I don't think I mentioned this as part of the beverages uh, shared service center uh, shortly after you know we kind of stood up the shared service center uh, Frito-Lay also you know joined uh, the shared service center in Mexico so not only do we have you know, just the beverages shared service, but also free to lay. So there's a lot of even cross divisional synergies, if you will, and efficiencies that we're driving together across Latin America. I think that's that's important to state. Yeah, and there was a as part of that was a two part question. Was it set up as a separate business unit in the shared? You know, was the shared service center a separate business unit and providing services? I think the, what happens a lot of com times companies. I don't think Pepsi did this, no. but they set it up as a separate business unit. That it's a shared service business that provides services no. to the units. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so uh, it wasn't a, a separate shared service center where they kind of their their own living, breathing division, if you will, and then obviously you know cross charge for their services. But once again, another great question because they are evolving into a kind of their own shared service center. Because uh, as I mentioned, the U.S. is looking to uh, you know take a lot of their accounts payable and receivables and inventory management to a shared service type of model, and there's been a lot of discussion. Although you know in the last six months I've been out of the loop, uh, but there's been a lot of discussion that Mexico will be utilized uh, as a shared service center for the U.S. and a lot of the you know true back office type uh, activities such as accounts payable, receivables, and, and inventory. Uh, so once again, a great question. We, we, we started uh, when I was the CFO as, as you know, really reporting into me. So we had the, uh, uh, the, shared, the director of shared service actually reported into 
my division controller who then reported to me. Uh, that's still the case, but there is a, uh, a, a migration, if you will, or a shifting where I do believe there's shared service center, which is quite, quite large, uh, uh, as you can imagine, for a 10 billion plus division, uh, will migrate to their own kind of standalone where, we'll, where, where they will provide services to the U.S., uh, obviously to Latin America, and then, you know, have their own cross-charge methodology to do that. But, you know, having said that, it's all pretty much structural, but at the end of the day, you know, everything that I mentioned regarding, you know, a lot the benefits, if you will, that we were able to reap almost immediately, I might add, uh, are st still going to be the case, whether they are a standalone shared services in Mexico or whether they, you know, kind of become their own, uh, yeah, I guess, profit center. Yeah, and I would add a little bit to that. I mean, what we've seen most of the time with our clients is that they don't really set up initially as a separate business unit, but as you move down the maturity cycle, and really for the large, maybe global organization like Tony's alluding to, eventually if you start serving more than one master, you get more of that structure put in place and, and, and the matured, and you're really going far down on the maturity cycle. Uh, you do go to the separate business unit, and then that's also where the outsourcing comes into play very heavily. Uh, then we have one final question uh, that it says, any social backlash from taking jobs and other revenue away from America, work, American workers and businesses. Uh, so I'll handle that one. I mean, this obviously is always a sensitivity uh, that, that people normally have when they look at this uh, and, and what it can do. Uh, I would say that in our experience, uh, that hasn't been the case. Uh, I mean, there's always some concern initially that executives have about that. But when, you, when they really look at their business and the business model, uh, and they look at the competitive environment that they're in, uh, they take a bigger picture approach and they realize these are areas of the business that are not making a competitive difference in, in, in the work that's being done. Um, it's, not, it's not these great jobs to begin with. Uh, and, and they basically are make, make the organization much stronger and thriving. Uh, and if you look at a company like Tiger Direct, I think it's a good example, the types of work that went offshore were very transaction-based work which freed up money to now invest and create, you know, other jobs, say in merchandising or more strategic activities. And I think that's the way most companies have looked at it, is while they may be saving money initially, that is being reinvested in other areas of the business that create higher value and really are higher paying jobs in most cases. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. Let me just add once again, real world example with PepsiCo and and and, and myself as, as a CFO. What I did, we, I think I talked about thirty thousand dollars or so ahead of savings, uh, you know, which which quite significant when when we looked at you know the the kind of the forced attrition that we had with shared services and what uh, what I had agreed with you know the division president is that I would take all these savings and really a put it back into the business or b you know, and more importantly, really shore up a lot of, uh, and I mentioned the fact that I really wanted to think, to have more people that, you know, would assist me with kind of the strategic thinking, thinking and the business development, and that's exactly what I did. You know, I went out and used these savings, as Roel alluded to, uh, and hired, you know, a couple of, you know, uh, a strategy uh, director as well as a business development director. So. Yeah, there, there, there was some attrition of some positions, but, you know, I also hired uh, higher quality uh, individuals that now, you know, really assist in what the, uh, you know, the value add uh, business activities or of a financial organization should really be. Um, so that's, that's how we handle it at PepsiCo. Because, once again, I mentioned that it's important on the implementation piece, you know, to have your HR folks as part of the steering committee you know, uh, communication, uh, and, and I could tell you at the end of the day, uh, you know, that there wasn't really any, you know, severe backlash. Uh, you know, personally I had, uh, you know, fairly large headquarters accounting and finance uh, team here in the U.S., and, and we were able to manage it, A, you know, very professionally uh, due to, you know, the constant communication, and B, uh, from a business perspective, really, you know, adding that, taking those savings and, and hiring uh, uh, individuals to help us on, you know, once again, the value-added the value added side of the business. So. Okay. Thanks. That was all the questions we had in the queue.
So thanks, Roel, Tony, and Gina um, for your time today. And thanks to all of our attendees for joining us today. Uh, the replay link will be available after the webinar, and a copy of the presentation will be sent to all the attendees shortly. Um, thanks a lot, and enjoy the rest of your day.